I'm super excited about this. This is where I uh, hand over the reins to my very competent co-hosts. They become the hosts, and I get to sit back and enjoy everything. Uh, this is Hazy History. Let me add this. Yes, Hazy History is here, and wow. it is a big one. It is Marge Shot, and uh, guys, uh, take it away. All right, Michael, you do have some work because you have photos to put up with there. So why don't you go to that first photo? Let's get started. We're talking about former Cincinnati's. Mar look at this looker right here. Oh, look what? Her. Yeah, look at that. There she oh, my. is. There she is. Dude? She actually was young once, Jack. Yeah, that. who's that guy? That That is Marge Shaw, who was born on oh. August 18th, 1920 in Cincinnati, Ohio, ironically enough. Her parents are George and Charlotte Unwear. In the jokes right themselves department, Marge was teased about the name, of course, including being called underwear and one Jack will believe in unaware. So Marge and her four sisters were born with the proverbial silver spoon in her mouth as her father was very successful in the lumber industry. Her father wanted a son, which he never got. So unfortunately for him and unfortunately for Marge, George introduced Marge to business and called her Butch. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Self-fulfilling prophecy. Yep. As a child, Marge was known for her love of animals, particularly dogs. The family owned a German shepherd named Baron, which she often credited with teaching her the value of loyalty and responsibility. Marge's love of dogs would become part of her mystique. Shall I say Gobble Jack? Yeah, let me just say yeah. that. It's Marge in 1952 married Charles Schott, who also came from a wealthy family. So this was obviously an arranged marriage. So Charles was very successful. He owned an ironworks company, a brick making company, but most importantly, which we'll talk about in a bit, car dealerships. And Mr. Schott, especially to me, anyways, died of a heart attack at the age of 42. So uh, you know, I just realized, Jack, yeah. uh, you better get your affairs in order. <laughs> yeah, me, yeah, dude. I'm thinking I better get that will written, huh? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> You know, I mean, okay, I, I jest. But in truth, it was said he was already in declining health due to a kidney ailment and from being married to Marge. Oh, so, Lord. you know. <laughs> he probably gave himself a heart attack. Yeah. So she was never involved in her husband's businesses at all, but was quick to do so after his passing. So that makes me suspicious too. Jack, can you get your inflation calculator ready, please? Because when, ready Mar when Mr. Schott it. died in 1968, their estate was worth an estimated $3.3 million. What is that in 2023, please? That would be $28,622,379.31 approximately. All right. You know what? You're still pretty wealthy nowadays at that. Uh, Michael, the next photo here. Now, there you go. There it is. There's the businesses. So being a woman taking over her husband's businesses was a challenge considering it's the late 60s and those industries are heavily male-driven, let me tell you. To give an example, General Motors did not believe she was qualified to run Shop Buick and moved to revoke the franchise. She fought for two years before the company signed a contract, making her its first female dealer in a major market. So this is like 1970, 1971. It took more fighting, but she was able to get a second GM dealership as well. And that battle, I hate to say the word, colored her attitude toward the business world. She called it a good old boys club. And funny enough, later she would say the same thing about being a female owner in Major League Baseball. So I guess, you know, I could say to quote, the godfather of soul, Mr. Dynamite, the hardest working man in show business. And the man was almost as many nicknames as Cowboy Jack Durango. Talk about James Brown. Hey, it's a man's, man's, man's world. But it wouldn't be nothing. Nothing without a woman or a girl. <laughs> and hang on. If that wasn't enough, remember I said her husband had a brick making company. She went to St. Louis to visit the company since she now owned it. The company's male executives gave her little information, but pat her hand and told her not to worry. It's fine. So Bruniverse, what do you think March shot did? Any guesses? Any guesses? Uh, she didn't worry about it and let, let them handle it? Of course. <laughs> no, she fired them all. Oh, of course. She was a lifelong Reds fan, including having a relationship with the franchise going back to 1963 
where she started an auction to raise money for Cincinnati Children's Hospital with Reds players in attendance. And then, sorry, Jack, in 1981, she paid $1.1 million for a minority stake in the group that bought the team. But, of course, that's not enough for Marge. As in December 1984, she bought the team for $24 million and put herself in charge of the team. Jack, I defer to you. Well, it's a well-known fact here at the Hazy History Department of the global powerhouse organization known as the Baseball Brew Crew that Pete Rose is as highly regarded as craft brewed tropical hazy IPAs. He's the reason I love baseball, and it is on my bucket list to meet the man and have him sign a Louisville Slugger before I leave this mortal coil. We all know that I will die long before the hit cake. Now, Bruniverse... Take a trip with me back to 1984. Wham! had just introduced the hit song, Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go, and Charlie Hustle had just accepted the role of manager for the Cincinnati Reds. Mr. Rose had a meeting with Large Marge at her house to discuss the baseball business of the Reds, and during the whole meeting, a 140-pound, misbehaved, hair-shedding, loud-barking St. Bernard dripped so much drool onto Mr. Rose's lap that he was soaked down to his signature jockey briefs. Charlie Hustle asked the human ashtray Marge shot if she could get the dog to stop, and she replied, to the hit king. The dog lives here, Pete. You're just visiting. <laughs> the dog was named Shotzi, and that was and was the unspoken real owner of the Cincinnati Reds during Marge's reign of terror. Imagine the Buick Regal sized brass cojones on Large Marge to look at one of the greatest ball players in the history of the game and tell him that. I can't, it blows my mind. But my friends, that was Marge and Shotzi. If you worked for the Reds organization during Marge's ownership, you knew three unwritten rules. One, never waste office supplies. Two, never question the owner. And three, never, ever say anything bad about that stupid <laughs> dog. <laughs> Managerial candidates would lose points if they didn't gush over the dog. Players were reprimanded if they objected to Shotzi relieving herself on the field. Front office employees would be berated when the media made fun of the animal's antics. During the 1990 Division Championship celebratory victory lap, Shotzi stopped and in open defiance of God dropped a big steaming John Rocker right in the middle of the field. <laughs> and that's not even the worst part. Marge Forced, forced, none other than Sweet Lou Pinella, who was packing three World Series rings at this point, to get a napkin and clean up Shotzi's mess. Oh. <laughs> this wasn't the first nor the last indignation that Sweet Lou had to endure from this dog. At the beginning of the 1990 season, Marge took a handful of filthy, disgusting dog hair and rubbed it all over Sweet Lou for good luck. That year, the Reds led the league wire to wire and took home the championship. So instead of crediting the efforts of players like Barry Larkin, Ken Griffey, or the trio of relief pitchers, Noam Charlton, Rob Dibble, and Randy Myers that were collectively known as the Nasty Boys. Yeah! Nasty Mar Boys. Good job, Jack. Marge attributed the team's success to the dog hair. And Sweet Lou was dusted with the nasty stuff before every game. Marge Shot is quoted as saying, Lou has to put up with it. He has no choice. Shotzi was such a focal point on the team that the scoreboard would display the words woof, woof when the team scored a run. Employees' paychecks were stamped with Shotzi's paw print. Marge sat out in the crowd during home games, out in the crowd amongst the people with that stupid smelly dog and would hand out autographed eight by tens of the slobbering smelly beast. There's the eight by 10. Thank you, Michael. The dog even made an appearance on the David Letterman show with her master in 1986. David Letterman, who's a dog lover himself, 
after listening to Marge ramble on and on and on about the dog for far too long, he said, I don't want to hear any more about your damn dog. I'm sorry I brought up this whole silliness. <laughs> When Shotzi passed away in 1991, the Reds handed out a press release in the middle of a game announcing that the mutt had been put to peace, which basically means it was buried in Marge's backyard with a Cincinnati Reds ball cap. Did the canine craziness in there? No, sir, it did not. Shotzi was replaced in 1991 with another big, dumb St. Bernard named Shotzi 2.0. 2.0 was an even bigger menace than its predecessor. It had the habit of stealing equipment and chewing on it, tripping players that were jogging during warm-ups, and dropping messes left, right, and center for the grounds crew to clean up. This was all during games, folks. The dog had the run of the field. There were so many complaints that the commissioner eventually had to, had to ban all dogs from all baseball fields across the whole country. Because of one dog. This is why we can't have nice things. Shotzi 2.0. <laughs> so poor Shotzi 2.0 was left to torture the Reds front office staff and only saw the field one more time when Marge threw a birthday party for it during a game with the Pirates in which neither the Pirates nor the crowd joined in singing happy birthday to the dog. <laughs> and guess what? The front office staff received a Marine drill sergeant style verbal beatdown from Marge herself because it was apparently their fault that nobody cared about the dog as much as she did. Oh my goodness. How do I follow that? Oh, let me take a breath. Oh, you know what? I want to say first, hey, what a crowd we have here. What a Bruniverse we have here. Hey. You know, people are nuts, though. You know, like, Marge shot here. Hey, you know. Hey, hey, you know, Marge shot. She's so cheap. How cheap was she? Thank you. Marge once made her general manager pay his own way to attend an all-star game, Michael Mondragon. Oh my come on. I mean, come on, you know. Hey, you know, Marge. Hey, hey, Marge shot. She was so cheap. How, How cheap, cheap was she? she? She turned off lights in the team offices when not in use. She went through trash to make sure scrap paper was written on both sides. She wanted the heat turned down to 55 degrees after 5 o'clock. Wow. <sighs> Hold on. I'm not done yet. Hey, I'm not done yet. Hey, you know, I'm just warming up here, you know. <laughs> hey, Marge. Marge was so cheap. How cheap was she? Was she? She didn't want to hire scouts because, quote, all they do is sit around and watch ball games, quote unquote. Hey, you know, what kind of job is that? Hey, you know, <laughs> you know, and in the opening week of the 1996 season, Marge shot, hey, hey, you know, she was so cheap. How uh, cheap was she? She refused to post scores of other games on the Riverfront Stadium scoreboard. Come <laughs> on here, you know. What did Marge say about this apparently? Hey, hey, you know, why do fans care about? One game when they're watching another. <laughs> Anyone want to take a wild guess how much it would cost in 1996 to do that for a month to show the scores of the other games? Why don't you take a wild guess? Anybody, anybody out there? That's anybody? interesting that there's a price. $10, I have to there's a fee for this. Yes. What? $10,000. In 1996, it would cost $350 to show the scores on a scoreboard. Wow. Line. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yes, of course. And hey, here's a fun one for you. Apparently some male employees occasionally would ask for an autographed photo of Marge to give to a <laughs> niece. And then they'd take it to a urinal and pee on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> however, however, she, the fans did like Marge somehow. You know, she tried to keep tickets low and concessions low when she took over the team in 1984. She kept the prices of do hot dogs at a buck and boxies around $12, which were the lowest in baseball. How about that? You know, geez, I can find something here. I didn't think I could. All right. Well, let's see. Jack, you'll you'll talk about this as well, but she was also known for not spending money on to help the team. You know, she openly complained about having to pay players while they were hurt. My example is pitcher Jose Rijo, who was, a, who was great in the 1990 World Series, which I'll talk about in a moment. He was able to elbow injury. Marge complained. I'm paying $3 million to have this guy sit on his butt. 
What do I say about that, Michael Bondragon? Uh, the only thing that you probably could say, uh, and uh, it would be... Thank you. She knew she was referred to as Cheap Marge, but she said this was how she was taught by her father to run a business. You know, next slide, please. And, oh, look at this. Oh, look at that. Right <laughs> oh, my. But somehow, even with all this pettiness, the Reds, as Cowboy Jack mentioned in 1991, won the World Series in what was considered a big upset as they beat the defending champion, Oakland A's. Yeah. Jack, did you hear what I just said? The A's were actually good once or twice. Huh. Yeah, I know. Shocking. Here she is with Sweet Lupinella with their with the trophy. But the success, of course, has cheap Marge all over it. She was mad that the Reds swept the series winning in four games. Why do you think that is? Uh, because uh, there's more games to be had. That's right. She suggested most of the money made off the series was only made after the series went further than a game five. She refused to pay for any post-game celebration for the team. Wow. And it was reported to have her opinions on the series ruined. Why? Wow. <laughs> Due to a dispute with Red center fielder and star Eric Davis. Eric Davis in game four of the World Series separated a lacerated kidney. All right? I mean, that... That sounds terrible, right? So what do you think the team did? They would not pay for his surgery. <laughs> Shocking. And that's not enough. The club made him pay his own way home after he was released from a hospital. <laughs> not in Cincinnati, but in Oakland where the World oh, Series ended. Anyway, all right? Lord. So here, here's maybe the a fabulous quote. All right? This is from Eric Davis. Quote, Ahem! If I were a dog, I would have gotten more care, and that's the truth. And there yeah. you go. That that's yep. it in a nutshell, right there. Wow. So the injury and the injury is so bad, it actually permanently affected his career, unfortunately. Then sweet Lou Pinnell here getting ready to just oh, either I, I would assume vomit after this kiss. <sighs> Left the team in 1992 after Marge wouldn't help him at all when I've never heard this. Lupinov was sued by an umpire named Gary Darling for defamation. Wow. He Lupinov had to get his own lawyer. So this is why we made the hashtag do the research on because I'd never heard about this story before. Yeah. Jack, I defer to you, sir. <clears throat> I'm going to jump around a bit and tell some uh, some more deplorable stories about her. On September 21st, 1989, the Cincinnati Reds were having a tough time. Manager and franchise hero Pete Rose had just been banned from baseball for life, and the team was on a nine-game losing streak. So, in an effort to bring some fun to the Riverfront Stadium, Reds broadcaster Marty Brenneman invited former world heavyweight champion and one of the best to ever lace up the boots. Ooh, yeah! He invited Macho Man Randy Savage. Yeah, dig it! to the broadcast booth to do some color commentary during a game. Everyone was loving this. The commentary crew, the crowd, the dugouts, the umpires were even huddling up to get a peek at the cream of the crop, who just so happened to be a former minor league ball player that had a cup of coffee in 1974 with the Reds-affiliated minor league team, the Tampa Tarpons. But I digress. The high spot of this visit was Macho Man himself, fully decked out in his gold and purple spandex, locked eyes with the red star player Eric Davis, and the two men had an epic pose down. They were flexing muscles that made every man in a 26-mile radius question th certain things about themselves, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Like I said, everybody was loving this except for one person, Marge Underwear Shot Stain. <laughs> Marge had the same reaction as a typical American Karen who witnessed a family barbecue at a park thrown by people of color. She wanted to shut it down and she wanted to shut it down now. The only difference is Marge had the power to stop it and stop it she did. She sent her nephew, Steve Shot who was a snot-nosed, <laughs> sniveling yes-man, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, to the commentary booth, and she had this little twerp kick the macho man Randy Savage out of the stadium. A legit superstar and celebrity that had main-evented WrestleMania earlier in the year. Yep. 
kicked him out of the stadium. Eric Davis himself was later quoted as saying, if it had been somebody from pet control, shot would have <laughs> <laughs> would have let him stay. And real quick, we did not coordinate that those two Eric Davis quotes. So very good, Jack. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> Macho King, Randy yeah, Savage. At this, point. Yeah. this was yeah. right after the mega powers exploded. Macho King was all over the place. Dig it. <laughs> <laughs> On to April 1st, 1996, seven pitches into the Reds opening day game against the Montreal Expos. Home plate umpire John McSherry staggered away from the batter's box after signaling a timeout and collapsed under his own weight. The game was halted as the 328-pound umpire lay unconscious due to a massive heart attack. McSherry had been diagnosed with an irregular heartbeat and was scheduled to see a doctor the following evening, but he didn't want to miss out on opening day, so he went and worked the game anyways. Bad decision. Listen to your doctor, boys and girls. So an Jack, hour you better in two years. Yeah. <laughs> so an hour after he was taken to the hospital, he was pronounced dead. The remaining umpires at Riverfront Stadium conferred with the players, and everyone agreed to postpone the game. Everyone had a heavy heart about the incident, even Large Marge. But she was more upset at the game's cancellation than a man's death. Her statement on the man's death is as follows. Can I well, please do Snow it? Well, it's no this morning and now this. I don't believe it. I feel cheated. This isn't supposed to happen to us. Not on, not on, not in Cincinnati. This is our history, our tradition, our team. Nobody feels worse than me. She was blasted by the media for her response, and the umpires felt that she viewed them as less than human. So she attempted to make a boneheaded apology and smooth things over by sending the umpires flowers and offering an apology of sorts basically the apology was her blaming the media for running her comments margie boys and girls did not buy the flowers herself she regifted them a television crew had given her the flowers the day before the man died total class act this lady total class act <laughs> so believe it or not after that, I'm going to talk about somehow the good Marge. There's actually a good Marge in all this. I'm, I'm, an, I'm going to mute myself. because <laughs> I got to get myself <laughs> off here. So her parents earlier that I mentioned, Charles, uh, her parents were not being great figures in the Cincinnati community, and that actually was passed down to Marge. They were very big on nonprofit organizations. To the point where in 1980, Marge, in honor of her late husband, started the Marge and Charles J. Shop Foundation. And it still exists, Cowboy Jack Durango. Wow. Still. Jack, you might need a bar bag for this more than drinking the Bud Light out of your shoe last week. Are you all right? Are you ready? Oh, you're on mute. That's right. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of her and the foundation's generosity. One million dollars are donated to the Boy Scout camp, which helped build an 18-acre lake named Lake Marge Shot. Oh. And several million dollars to an elephant exhibition at the Chicago Zoo and Botanical Gardens. The zoo named an Asian elephant named Shotzi for her. She even donated a second Asian elephant later, which was named Princess Shotzi 2. <laughs> and here she is. Who she just celebrated her 47th birthday in December. Wow. How about an aw? Oh my gosh, really? Yes, that is for real. That is crazy. Now, I'm gonna talk about two more things. Remember this for the end of the uh, for the end, please. Mark personally donated money, a million to St. Ursula Academy, an all-girls high school, for a building that ended up being named for her. She also did half a million dollars for an athletic field, which was then named Jack Mute. Shotzi Stadium. <laughs> yes, I'm not kidding. After her death, University of Cincinnati Baseball Stadium was named March Shot Stadium in 2006. After her foundation donated $2 million to the school's athletic program. So I'm going to quote the director of the local Humane Society, which is another favorite charity of Marge's. Quote, anything where children or animals are involved, Marge is there for you. Jack, have fun. 
Well, former baseball commissioner Faye Vincent said after Marge Underwear Shot died, I think Mrs. Shot tried hard to represent her town and her fan base. And a lot of the fans did love her. But we all have demons and hers were overwhelming. These demons, my friends, are a collection of the most backwards, hateful, repugnant, disgusting, hateful, homophobic, racist, xenophobic thoughts that can't be washed clean by acts of philanthropy or explained away that she was from another time or excused for one dollar freaking hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I have to give a disclaimer right now to everybody watching. The language that is used in this last section is a little rough, but we here at the Hazy History Bullpen feel that it's important to convey what an absolute waste of skin and oxygen this woman was. In 1994, just a few weeks after serving an eight-month suspension for making racial slurs, Marge Schott was making a speech in downtown Cincy and began pontificating about Ken Griffey's earring. And she made the senior. comment that or junior, oh junior was junior or senior I don't know who it was it only was junior junior okay, only sorry. fruits wear earrings oh oh this is 1996 Marge had a rule not to hire African Americans in any other role other than playing ball and she resented the fact that she had to hire black players. During testimony for a lawsuit brought against her by Red's front office employees, it was stated that Marge would refer to our man Eric Davis, pictured here, and Dave Parker and other high-paid African-American players as her million-dollar inwards. She, of course, denied this, but then openly admitted that she would often use the inward multiple times a day, but as a joke. Guys, where there's smoke, there's fire. Marge kept a collection of Nazi memorabilia on display in her home that included a whole lot of swastikas and multiple pieces of Nazi uniforms. She actually said in an, in an interview once, and I quote, these are her words, Hitler was good in the beginning, but just went a little too far. This wasn't the only time that she made flattering remarks about Hitler, along with referring to Jewish people as money-grubbing Jews. As an equal opportunity, hateful piece of shot, she also went on record stating that she did not like Asian kids because they were outdoing our kids in high school. Oh. Kevin, I can no longer dwell in the mud with this human being. Take us home, babe. Are you okay, Jack? I just keep going. How about that right there? That'll make you feel better, right? Yes. Yes. So then this on a happier note and funnier note, she was suspended, and I think it was like the third or fourth time, and had to actually give up control of the team in 1998. <laughs> and here, another funnier note. She did actually sue the new CEO of the team over the placement of her seats at the ballpark in 2003. Even better and funnier for Cowboy Jack is she died the following year from emphysema. So there you go. And yes. there's her tune in 2004. So, Jack, do, Jack, Jack, I'm sorry. Jack's not going to remember this. Everyone else. Do you guys remember when I talked about St. Ursula Academy and University of Cincinnati earlier? Oh, yeah. Well, oh, good. I'm glad somebody's paying attention. <laughs> well, in June 2020, a former player from the University of Cincinnati started a petition to change the name of the stadium because of her racial views. It was voted unanimously by the trustee of the university to take her name off the stadium. Boom! If that wasn't enough, also in, it's I'm sorry, it is now simply called UC Baseball Stadium. I got excited. Also in June of 2020, St. Ursula Academy took the names off the Marge Shot Building and Shotzi Stadium. And with that, Cowboy Jack Durango, I don't know why I'm even going to ask this question, but I think I know this. Who is... The deplorable baseball bum of the month. Well, Kevin, I'm glad that you asked. The Baseball Brew Crew's Hazy History's official deplorable baseball bum of the month award gets awarded to none other than the woman covered in dog slobber and dog hair that I can only assume smelled like a urinal that was also used as an ashtray in a Tijuana bar, large Marge underwear shot. So, Marge Shot, Cowboy Jack Durango, and I 
We'll see you in. <laughs> and that's Mark's shot, boys and girls. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? Well, what? Cowboy Jack Durango. It's the Hit King Pete Rose congratulating you on the podcast on your third year anniversary. Wow. You went for a Cowboy Jack from a novice about baseball. You know all about baseball. A huge fan due to the podcast. Okay. And instantly became your favorite player. I did. I'm honored to hear that. You call yourself Charlie Guzzle and the Hop King on the show and a beer-related tribute to me. I didn't drink no beer. Okay, thank you. And the podcast for all the support and inducting me into your baseball brew crew, Diamond Icons in 2022. Keep it up. Who made this possible? The Baseball Blue Crew Podcast. That's who. I'm, dude, I am crying right now, dude. Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That was amazing. <laughs> oh, dude, not, not often am I left with, a, with no words, but I, I got nothing. That was one of the most beautiful things that's ever happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys! I can't believe you did that. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I, that's the only way that I figured we could end out hazy history. Uh, you guys hit it out of the park. 